Hello and good morning dear students and welcome to Baitu's exam prep IS. Today let us take a look at the various topics that we will be dealing with in today's Hindu news analysis. So for the detailed discussion we have four articles lined up. The first article, this is a very important article regarding the finance commission. Now you know the article 280 of the Indian constitution, it asks the government to set up the finance commission for every five year duration, right? So in this particular editorial article, it is being discussed that what all responsibilities, what all different things will the 16th finance commission will have to take care of to give very good recommendations for the government in the future. The second article, now this is a very important one once again because this is talking about what? A new phenomena that has been stated by the United Nations General Secretary, global boiling. So we'll take a look at this as well. The third article is regarding the relations between India and Japan. Now the foreign minister of Japan, he has come to India. There were discussions between the external affairs minister of India and the foreign minister of Japan and what all discussions they were, what all were the various things that were discussed over here, we'll take a look at that. Finally, the last article in the detailed analysis part is about semiconductors. Now, we are conducting the Semicon India. Now, Semicon India, it is a global level conference that is under, that is organized by the government of India. So, the second such conference we are organizing right now and PM Modi, he addressed this conference. Now, what is Semicon India? What are the major schemes regarding the semiconductor sector in India? We'll take a look in this particular segment. Next, we have the prelims bite section. In this, we have two important articles. First is about the Bharat stage norms. Now, according to reports, the various vehicles which are following the BS3 norms, the petrol vehicles which are following BS3 norms and the diesel vehicles following the BS4 norms, they won't be allowed to run on the roads of Delhi NCR region if the AQI, the air quality index, it hits the severe category. The second one is about two new health related bills that were introduced and quickly passed in the Lok Sabha recently. One was regarding the nurses and midwives and the second one was regarding the dentists. So we'll take a look at these as well. So let us now start with our first topic, charting the path for the 16th Finance Commission. Now this article is written by two people who have done exemplary work in the field of public finance. We have C. Rangarajam and Mr. D. K. Srivastav. Both of them, they were part of the 12th Finance Commission. The 12th Finance Commission, it gave the recommendations for the duration of 2005 to 2010. So what does this article say? We'll take a look. See, now the time has come to establish the 16th Finance Commission. Right now, between 2020 to 25, we are following the recommendations of the 15th Finance Commission. And the 16th Finance Commission, it needs to be set up to give the recommendations for the duration of 2025 to 2030. Now, the 15th Finance Commission, it was set in 2017. So, ideally, the 16th Finance Commission, it should have been set in 2022. But we are still awaiting the setting up of the Finance Commission. Now, since the recommendations given by the 15th Finance Commission, there have been a lot of changes in the world at a global scale. First, the COVID pandemic, it hit in 2019. It took us almost more than two years to get to the normal conditions now. Then the various geopolitical challenges, the war between Russia and Ukraine. And also the various skirmishes we are facing at the LAC with China. Apart from that, one very important thing that happened was that 
the combined government debt to GDP ratio. Combined government debt to GDP ratio, that means for both the governments, the union government plus the various state governments, the combined debt to GDP ratio, it has almost reached the 90% limit. Now debt to GDP ratio, very easily it is what? A ratio between the total debt of the government and the total GDP of the government. So a lower debt to GDP ratio, it means that the country is producing enough goods and services in order to service the loans and the debt that it has already taken without taking any new loans or debts. Okay, so it needs to be low to show that the to show that government is trustworthy. It is properly using our financial resources. Now the 14th Finance Commission, the 14th Finance Commission, it undertook a very important decision. It raised the share of the states in the pool of taxes, in the divisible pool of taxes to 42%. This was a 10% raise. Earlier, the share of the states in the entire divisible pool of taxes was just 32%. Okay. So, 14th Finance Commission, it raised this. Later on, when the number of states reduced, when Jammu and Kashmir, it was bifurcated into two union territories, this share was further reduced to 41%. So, according to the article, this particular amount, this particular share of the states in the divisible pool, it is enough. There is no strong case to recommend any further increase in the share of the states in this divisible pool. However, there is one thing that needs to be addressed. That is the role of surcharges and cesses. Now, you know that surcharges and cesses Whatever is applied on the various goods and services that you consume, they directly go to whom? The union government. The states, they do not have any share in these surcharges and cesses. Now, over time it has been seen that the share of surcharges and cesses in the total revenue, the total tax revenue, it has been increasing. So what does it mean? that the divisible pool, it is not increasing, but the share of union in the total tax revenue, it has been increasing. In fact, during 2020-21 to 2023-24, the effective share of states in centers gross tax revenue, it was close to 31%, which was much lower than 35% which was during 2015-16 to 2019-20. So that means that the union, it is taking up the whole surcharges, it is increasing its income through surcharges and cesses and because of that the share of the states in the center's gross tax revenue, it has been reducing. So what is the share, how it is increasing the share of cesses and surcharges? It is increasing by the rate like this. 18.5% of centers GTR, gross tax revenue during 2020-21 to 2023-24. Okay, compare that to 2015-16 it was just 12.8 percent. Now some of you are confused what are surcharges and what are cesses. Now cesses they are they are imposed for some very particular reasons like education cess, like Swachh Bharat cess. So any amount that is raised through these cesses it has to go only for these particular things okay so education says if 1000 rupees 
is raised for education says all those thousand rupees it must be used for the purpose of education surcharges there are some extra taxes that are imposed on the taxes okay for example if someone has an income more than 1 crore this is just an example they are paying tax of 30 percent over that 30 percent tax what will be the 30 percent of 1 crore 30 lakh over that 30 percent a small surcharge like 1 percent or 2 percent or anything it can be imposed so surcharge is basically a tax over the tax and says is basically a particular amount that is taken by the government for from you for a particular reason so this particular thing the increasing role of surcharges and cesses it requires extensive scrutiny by the 16 finance commission in fact what have they recommended what have the writers recommended they have said that during the 13th finance commission the share of surcharges and cesses was somewhere close to 9.6%. So there should be an upper limit of the share of surcharges and cesses in centers gross tax revenue. They said that this upper limit must be 10%. In case this upper limit is breached, then the the share of the states in the divisible pool of the taxes it should also increase so that while the center's income is increasing the state's income should also increase next next issue that they addressed was this see the share of the individual states in the center's divisible pool it is decided by a set of indicators See, when we talk about the finance commission, it is talking about vertical distribution of money. It is also talking about the horizontal distribution. Vertical distribution, that is distribution between the center and the states. So a particular figure is given for this. Right now it is 41%. So out of the total pool, total divisible pool, 41% will be given to the states. The rest of it, it will be used by the center. Now amongst this 41%, how will the money be distributed between the various states? That is known as the horizontal distribution of finances. Now this horizontal distribution of finances, it follows certain indicators. Indicators like what is the population level? of the state what is the per capita income what is the area of the states certain incentive related factors like the forest cover of the state what has been the demographic changes experienced in the state okay so amongst these indicators one indicator is a big point of contention between various states that is the per capita income now this, why is this a point of contention? Because the share of this indicator in deciding how much money will a state get, it is very high. 45% weight. Okay. So all these indicators, this is 100%. They have certain shares. This particular indicator has 45% weight in deciding whether or not a state will get higher amount of money or lower amount of money in from that divisible pool so per capita income's weight is 45 percent now per capita income it is the distance of the state's per capita income for example take a state like say haryana so what is Haryana's per capita income? Say it's X, Y, Z. It is compared to the average base level or the benchmark. How is the benchmark calculated? It is usually kept at the average per capita income of the top three states. Okay. So the benchmark is say A, B, C. So what is the distance between X, Y, Z and A, B, C? For example, if this is 10, this is 100. The distance is 90 rupees. For another state, say like Madhya Pradesh, 
the distance might be higher. For a state like Gujarat, the distance might be lower. Right? So on the basis of distance, it is decided that how, how much money will the state get. If the distance is higher, if the difference between this benchmark and the state's per capita income is higher, then the state will get larger amount of money because they are lagging behind. We need to help them. Another reason why it is important to give these states higher amount of money is that they are expected to provide a relatively larger share of the demographic dividend to India. They are younger compared to the other states. So it is necessary that proper investment is done in these states so that the demographic dividend of these states, it does not convert into demographic burden. We need to invest in facilities like education, like healthcare, like infrastructure, so that these states they can develop the, their populations well. Okay. However, the other states which do not have this large distance, they are very, you know, very irritated about this fact. They are like, we have worked hard and that's why we have come to this point. Why should our share be lowered compared to those states? So for that, there is a recommendation by this particular article. It recommends that this weight of per capita income, it can be frozen to only 40%. And the rest of the money, it can be provided to these states in the form of resource grants that the center directly provides to that state, okay? So the, this difference, it should be provided in form of resource grants. So these states, the backward states, they will also get the money for their development. Whereas the states, the developed states, they will also not feel that they are not being taken care of. There are some other recommendations as well under this article. So these recommendations are the article's recommendations. These are not recommendations of any finance commission. See, as I said, the combined debt to GDP ratio of India, it has increased a lot, touched almost 90%. It is 89.8% in 2020 okay? Out of which centers debt to GDP ratio it is 58.7% and that of the states is 31%. Now, if you remember, there is something called FRBM. Fiscal Responsibility and Budget Management. So, according to this FRBM norms, it is recommended that the debt to GDP ratio of the center should be 40% and that of the state should be 20%. It should not breach beyond these levels. However, we are already breaching it for center almost 20% breach, for the states almost 10% breach. Okay, so this particular article, it wants to understand that why are we still keeping these norms at 40 and 20%? They should be re-examined. So the 16th Finance Commission, according to the article, should re-examine the FRBM Act. This was also recommended. The same recommendation was also given by the 15th Finance Commission. But because of, you saw how many challenges we are facing, right? So because of these challenges, this particular Fiscal Responsibility Act, it has not been amended beyond 2018. Apart from that, the fiscal deficit, it has also shot up. The center's fiscal deficit, what is fiscal deficit? The difference between total expenditure and total revenue. So the fiscal expenditure, it has also shot up to 9.2% of GDP. And for the states, the average fiscal deficit is 4.1% percent of the GDP. So that means that FRBM really need to be 
given an overhaul so that the fiscal deficit and the debt to GDP ratios they can be clearly understood, re-examined and the thresholds for them they can be set once again. There are also certain other recommendations you must have heard how during elections many parties they promise for certain freebies. What are these freebies doing? They are taking away the money from the developmental aspects to the consumptive aspects. So the government is using this money that they have for just consumption purposes. They are not doing any kind of development. So because of that the fiscal health of many states it is reducing. So in that regard what has the, the article recommended? That there should be a loan council which was also recommended by the 12th finance commission and this loan council should oversee the magnitudes of the loans that the various governments both the central as well as the state governments they are taking okay so this is one recommendation the second is that the 16 finance commission should examine the subject of non-merit based subsidies that is something called freebies in detail their limit it should also be set up it, the finance commission it should become very strict with regards to states maintaining fiscal deficit within the certain limits and for that they can follow a carrot and stick policies what will be the carrot if the states they are able to follow this they'll get extra incentives what will be the stick for the states which won't be able to follow this their scrutiny of the various loans of the future, it will be very strict. Now quickly about finance commission. See finance commission, it is set up under article 280 of the Indian constitution. It is set up to make recommendations on the distribution of the financial resources between the center and the states. So under this, three things are targeted. The vertical distribution already explained the horizontal explained and the grants this is also explained so these three things they are the major things that the finance commission needs to recommend about now these recommendations please note they are advisory in nature they are not binding on the center okay so center need not implement some of these recommendations now the union government they notify through a presidential order the acceptance of the recommendations and within this presidential order they also state that for which duration will these recommendations work it is usually five years apart from that there is a parliamentary scrutiny as well so the central government they need to table in the parliament of india an explanatory document regarding what all actions they took on the recommendations of the finance commission and if they did not adopt any of the recommendations what is the reason for that okay so this is about the first article now the second one regarding climate change now what is global warming what is global boiling see when you put water on the stove it first gets warmed up after that the boiling start so according to the United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres, the global warming it has now converted into global boiling. Why did he say that? Because right now many scientific evidences they are coming up to say that this July of 2023 is the hottest month in the last 12,000 years. Very huge duration. And in fact, they this person, Antonio, Antonio Guetres, he also stated that unless there comes a mini ice age for 29 to 31st July, this particular scenario will not change. July will stay the hottest month in this 12,000 year duration. 
There are scientists from the World Meteorological Organization, from European Commission's Copernicus climate change surface, which saw that the July month, it saw the hottest three-week period on record ever since they start taking, started taking record. Now, average temperatures in July so far have been 16.95 degrees centigrade, which is 0.2 degrees Celsius warmer than July 2019. Now, this is a record, this temperature. 16.95 degrees. It is a record in the 174 years since the observation started in European Union region. Okay, European Union came later, but observation started much earlier. The European Union has the data. So in the 174 year period, this is the hottest duration right now. Now what are the concerns? See, we knew that this year will be El Nino year. For the past three years, we had La Nina. Now, during El Nino years, generally, the temperatures, they are higher than the usual. Okay, The ocean temperatures are also higher. We were expecting this. But the problem is, the biggest concern is, what is the impact of this increased temperature at the various regions in the world? We can see those impacts in very real time right now. In, for example, in China, in the northwestern part of China, the temperatures went beyond half boiled. They were 52 degrees Celsius. There are extensive wildfires in Greece. Many people, they perished. Many people, they had to be evacuated from Greece. There are wildfires soaring in Canada. The, there is heat waves, extensive heat waves in USA, specifically in the southwestern parts of USA, which again can trigger a lot of forest fires. Apart from that, you must be seeing that in India as well, there has been a lot of rains this year. This extraordinary amount of high rains, in usually drier and semi-arid parts of India, that is northern and western India, it is mainly due to the monsoon conditions, but they are also due to another reason. See, warm air, it has the higher capacity to hold the moisture. It has higher capacity to hold moisture and this huge amount of moisture, it suddenly gets poured down when it hits the dew point. So this is causing torrential bursts, which is again causing flooding and devastation. You must have seen news articles about Himachal Pradesh. Where one of the worst flash floods they have hit in the past few weeks. Now, what is the solution? There is only one solution for this. We have to limit the global temperature rise to 1.5 degree Celsius. Now, this will be possible according to Mr. Antonio Guetres. This will be possible only if the leading economies of the world, they take charge of the situation. They ensure that they are taking care of this particular limit. They are following their Paris Convention INDCs. Now, India, our Prime Minister recently announced that India in the next five years is going to become the third biggest economy of the world. So, for in that case, India's responsibility with regards to climate change also increases. So, India had given a target of zero net emissions by the year 2070. According to Mr. Antonio Guetres, India needs to up this target to 2050. We also need to stop generating any kind of electricity from the fossil fuel sources by the year 2040. So we need to wait to see whether or not India will be able to commit to these targets. Now when we are talking about climate change, this becomes very important. What is climate tipping points? See, 
you have a ball over here you are pushing the ball you pushed it until here it will go back to this location you push it until here it will again go back to this location but once it reaches this point and you push it a little bit more it will move over here it will not be able to come back over here unless an external force drags it over here right so this this particular point is the tipping point the point of no return so basically climate tipping points they are critical thresholds that when crossed they lead to large and often irreversible changes in the climate system so there are many tipping points that have been observed by the scientists all across the world you can see over here here are 16 tipping points and these bars these red color bars they show when will these tipping points they will start tipping to the irreversible side okay so this is the central estimate this is the minimum and the maximum so the current level of global warming is what 1.1 degree celsius right now what 1.1 degree celsius above what so the base that we consider for this is the average temperature between the duration of 1850 to 1900 that is the pre industrial level of temperatures so above this average uh, the average temperature of earth it has risen by 1.1 degrees okay so with that rise already a few tipping points they have started showing up first is the greenland ice sheet collapse now this is important the amount of melting that is going on both in the northern and the southern hemisphere it is quite huge both in greenland and as well as antarctica right and because of this you'll see in the upcoming slide there are problems in gulf stream as well so what are the tipping points that we are already starting to see first is greenland ice sheet collapse they we have already starting to see how this is melting increasingly over the years west antarctic ice sheet collapse this is also happening tropical coral reef die offs this is extensively happening in fact 2 3 days ago there was a news that how in the eastern coast or the gulf region of north america there is an extensive die off of corals then northern permafrost abrupt thaw thaw means melting what is permafrost the ground that is permanently frozen okay now permafrost it exists in various locations across the earth okay so surface it might not be frozen but under surface there might be certain region that is permanently frozen we are seeing that this permafrost it is also thawing very abruptly in the various regions because of the extensive heat the, this another one labrador sea current collapse we are almost reaching the point where this cold current the labrador sea current which is a part of what north atlantic ocean circulation it will also collapse eventually it starts from here okay so you can see that these five tipping points we are almost reaching them if this is at 1.1 degree celsius this is at 1.5 degree celsius more tipping points will be achieved if we reach 1.5 and in case of 2 there will be further increase in the number of tipping points so once we reach these tipping points there is no coming back we will reach a cycle of irreversible change now now two days ago 
there was another article a very important research it was published in this particular magazine known as journal known as nature communications now what was this research it said that the gulf stream which is a warm current in the northern atlantic ocean it might collapse as early as 2025 so the range it gave was 2025 to 2095 where the median point where it will collapse will be 2050 okay so it might collapse as early as 2025 as late as 2095 so this is a part of what the atlantic meridional overturning circulation now this circulation is very important for transferring heat as well as nutrients from the lower latitudes to the higher latitudes right now if this collapse then that that will have devastating impacts on the global climate in fact regarding amoc Atlantic meridional overturning circulation there was a research published in 2018 this research said that amoc is already at its weakest in the past 1600 years now what is the reason for this global warming see what is happening with regards to gulf stream because of the global warming the green greenland ice sheets they are melting at a very fast rate now gulf stream is a warm current green greenland ice melt is cold right so what is happening it is stifling or repressing the gulf stream so water coming from here it is stifling or repressing the gulf stream this is gulf stream north atlantic drift norwegian current right so gulf stream it is getting stifled or repressed by the cold water coming from greenland now what will be the impact of this collapse of amoc and the gulf stream see you know that earth has various pressure belts now these pressure belts are based on the temperature or the heat levels at the various latitudes now heat is distributed throughout the earth either through winds or through ocean currents now if the ocean currents they start weakening what will happen this distribution of heat it will not take place so the pressure belts they might also change now the pressure belts if they are changing this will also lead to changes in the jet streams changes in the atmospheric circulation and this can cause all these problems first if there are changes in the movement of the jet streams in the pressure belts then that will reduce the amount of rainfall experienced in western africa south america and india now africa and india even south america they are mostly agriculture based economies so this can lead to a widespread famine and it can also reduce the availability of food in the global markets apart from that reduction of rain in south america it can cause what it can parch or dry out the amazonian rain forests which are the lungs of the world moreover the cooling down there will be cooling down of western europe see we have gulf stream then north atlantic drift and then the norwegian current now these are warm currents now these currents north atlantic drift and norwegian current they help in keeping the western europe warmer compared to the other latitudinal locations okay same latitudinal locations so this failure of the gulf stream it will cause an increase in cooling down of western europe it will also lead to intensification of the storms in the region because of this cooling moreover there will be slight sea level rise which will be seen on the eastern coast of north america because there will be water pile up over here see the current it will weaken it won't be able to transfer water and there will be pile up of water in this region 
also they might this change in the atmospheric and oceanic circulation because of the failure of amok and gulf stream it can lead to further weakening of the ice sheets of antarctica and this will eventually lead to further increase in the sea level so that is about this particular article it is very important for your mains this term global boiling please note that down it is very important now we come to our next article which is about the indo japan relationships see the japanese foreign minister mr yosh yoshi masha hayashi he is currently in india for the 15th annual india japan foreign minister strategic dialogue so he is in india for this purpose and during this dialogue there was a press conference after this dialogue there was a press conference now in this press conference india and japan stated that we would rather place emphasis on peace time cooperation with each other that is more on developmental cooperation compared to war time cooperation with regards to the tensions in the taiwan strait region the strait between china and taiwan see china it has been reasserting its hegemony in the south china and the east china sea region okay usa it is very worried about it japan is also worried okay now india japan usa and australia they form what quad the quad grouping so everyone is trying to urge india to bring a statement against china for its actions in china and taiwan region however india is following a very pragmatic approach see even during the heightened us china tensions in taiwan when the speaker of us nancy pelosi she visited taipei that is the capital of taiwan in august 2022 india issued its statement it said that both the sides they should have restraint they should restrain themselves from escalating any kinds of tensions in asian region in the indo pacific region india did not join its squad partners usa australia and japan where the, the foreign ministers of these countries they brought out a statement that demanded that china stop any kind of military activity in the taiwan strait so india is being very pragmatic india has always reiterated its belief that any kind of dealing between the countries any kind of dealing regarding tensions and skirmishes between the countries it should be bilateral in nature so we have said that we hope to resolve any kind of issues with beijing in a diplomatic and a bilateral manner we do not in our relations we do not want any external interference so we are also not doing any kind of external interference in the actions of china now a quick recap about india japan relations see india and japan we signed a peace treaty with with each other in the year 1950 and with that our diplomatic relations they started in fact india was one of the first countries with which japan signed this peace treaty in 2005 we established a global partnership between both japan and india which was elevated this bilateral relation it was elevated to special strategic and global partnership in the year 2014 so we moved towards strategic partnership as well apart from simple global partnership since 2005 also there have been annual summits between india and japan summit the meetings between the heads of the state both of these countries they have committed for a free and open indo pacific region we want this region to be free open 
beyond any kind of hegemony of any one particular country, be it USA, be it China, be it India, be it Japan. In October 2008, now we are talking about what defense related relations. In October 2008, we had a joint declaration between India and Japan on security cooperation. Apart from that, there are also various platforms that are available between the two countries to discuss any kind of strategic or defense partnerships. We have two plus two meetings, foreign and defense ministerial meeting and apart from that annual defense ministerial dialogue and coast guard to coast guard dialogue. To discuss the defense relations. Now in September 2020, this was very important for us. We signed, India and Japan signed ACSA, Acquisition and Cross Servicing Agreement. Now this was an agreement regarding reciprocal provisions of supplies and services to the armed forces of countries. For example, if any Japanese armed forces, they dock on Indian port, we will provide them with all kinds of supplies and services and same will happen if any Indian ship, it docks on the Japanese ports. Okay. Specifically in regards to activities like UN peacekeeping operations, any bilateral training activities, any humanitarian international relief operation or any other mutually agreed activity. So this is very important. In fact, India has similar agreement signed with various other countries like USA, like Singapore, Australia, France and Oman. Apart from that, the two countries, they also have bilateral, multiple bilateral exercise. We have a naval exercise known as GMEX. We have Shinyu Metri, which is the Air Force exercise and Dharma Guardian, which is a military exercise. Apart from that, both India and Japan, they are also involved in the Malabar exercise along with USA. Initially, these exercises were only between India and USA. Later on, Japan also became a part of this exercise. Moreover, we are also a part of quadrilateral security dialogue that is quad. So this is the defense relationship between India and Japan. Now what regarding the economic relationship? See Japan, it started yen loans. They were giving us loans in yen currency. So they started yen loans to India in the year 1958. And India became the first country of the world to accept such kind of yen loans. Currently in the year 2021, India was the 18th largest trading partner for Japan, while Japan is India's 13th largest trading partner. The direct investments from Japan, they are also increasing year on year. In fact, in financial year 2021, Japan was the fifth largest investor in India. Also, during this meeting for which the Japanese foreign minister came to India, it was decided the two, two sides, the two states, they recommended or recommitted to a 5 trillion yen target for Japanese investment within the duration of the 5 years of 2022 to 27. Also, Japan, it has recently adopted its new Indo-Pacific policy. Now, under this policy, the foreign minister of Japan, he said, he reiterated that the focus, the main focus is on India improving relations with India. Apart from that, also starting projects in other countries like Sri Lanka and Bangladesh with support of India. So we'll be starting certain collaborative projects with Japan in these countries. So this is about this particular article. Why I included only defense 
and economic relations because this article the discussion was mainly on these two perspectives the rest of it you must have already covered in your IR section the last article is about this our Prime Minister Sri Naren Modi he attended Semicon India what it is we'll take a look in the upcoming slide over here he said that India can become the hub of the chip making industry apart from that the head of Vedanta group Mr. Anil Agrawal he also stated that he will be setting up a semiconductor fabrication unit in India within 2.5 years earlier they were collaborating with Foxconn to establish a semiconductor unit now they both the parties they'll be doing it at their own so the second semicon India it is currently being held in Gandhinagar in the state of Gujarat now this particular conference it is annually organized since last year by the India semiconductor mission what it is we'll take a look at that as well now this is done in partnership with the industry which is involved in the semiconductor manufacturing as well as various industry associations like CII Confederation of Indian Industries and other such organizations now this is done under the ages of Ministry of Electronics and Information Technology now the aim of this particular conference is to make India a global hub for semiconductor design manufacturing and technology development we are focusing on all three things first is the design stage manufacturing stage research and development that is the tech stage so we are focusing on all these three stages we want to make India a hub for all these three so this will help in propelling the vision of the India semiconductor mission which also aims to do the same now about a little about the semiconductors see semiconductors their conductivity levels they lie between the conductors and the inductors or the insulators so they lie in this spectrum they lie somewhere between the conductors and the insulators their conduction level it is lesser than the conductors now they can be made by various kind of products like if we are using the pure elements then silicon or germanium or if we are using various compounds then compounds like gallium arsenide and cadmium selenide they can be used for construction of these semiconductors now the importance of these semiconductors is that they are used to make semiconductor chips now these chips they are used everywhere they are used in your phones they are used in your laptops they are used in the chandrayaan they are used everywhere okay so they have very extensive use and over the years with the increase in the it with the it revolution their demand it has been increasing so recently the world saw an extensive shortage of these chips because of two reasons one was high demand see because of pandemic what happened there was an increase in work from home so a lot of people they started demanding more and more type of electronics so the demand of these it increased moreover people were afraid to use public transport so the demand for automobiles it also increased now automobiles they also require these chips so that is why there was a high demand of these chips which led to a crunch or the shortage in supply moreover there were certain supply chain constraints because of the pandemic also recently China has adopted this policy that they would not be exporting or they would be limiting the export of two very important elements that is germanium and gallium now both of these they are used for manufacturing what 
semiconductor chips. So that's why because of the geopolitics that is also associated with this particular topic that is why India wants to develop its own capacities with regards to semiconductor production. Now what is Semicon India program? Now this program it was launched back in the year 2021 in the month of December. The outlay or the money provided for this particular scheme was 76,000 crore rupees. The main aim was development of semiconductors and to display the dis manufacturing ecosystem in India. We wanted to give subsidies to the various players who, who wanted to come and invest in India or the Indian players who were already existing to invest in the semiconductor sector. Now the scheme it was further modified in the year 2022 in September. Now under this modification two important steps were taken. The, the central government it was agreeing to provide a fiscal incentive of 50% of the total cost of project to any companies any group of companies or joint ventures who wanted to set up any kind of semiconductor design fabrication manufacturing sectors centers in India. Apart from that fiscal incentive of 50% was also being provided for setting up display fabs of certain technologies in India as well. So 50% up to 50% incentives of the total project cost. So that is a very high amount. Now the biggest constraint in setting up semiconductor industry in India is the high amount of investment that is required. So government is trying to take care of that aspect. So what is India Semiconductor Mission? Now India Semiconductor Mission, it is an independent division, independent business division which lies within the Digital India Corporation. Now what is the responsibility? The responsibility is the same. To develop India's capacities with regards to manufacturing, design and technology with regards to semiconductors. So, uh, so it has a specific advisory body that is attached to it which includes many global experts as well to advise this body on how India's semiconductor ecosystem can develop and improve. It is also working as a nodal agency for the scheme that we just talked about that is the Semicon India program. So under Semicon India program whoever is filing the various applications these applications are first scrutinized by the India Semiconductor Mission and then they are given approval and accordingly they are provided with the subsidies. So this is about the detailed analysis portion. Now quickly we will cover the prelim bite sections where we have two articles lined up. One is regarding the Bharat stage norms. Now Bharat stage norms. According to a report, in the Delhi NCR region, any Bharat Stage 3 petrol vehicles or Bharat Stage 4 diesel vehicles, they would not be allowed to ply on the roads if the air quality index of the region, it goes, it hits the severe category. Now, what are these Bharat Stage norms? How did this whole story start? See, it started in the early 90s when the first emission standards of India, they were introduced. Now these emission standards were first introduced. Apart from that, there were also certain policy decisions that were taken by the government with regards to reduction of the emissions from the vehicles. Like employing catalytical, catalytic converters which reduced the amount of harmful emissions from your vehicles. So the government made the use of these catalytic converters mandatory for the various petrol vehicles. Later unleaded petrol 
it was also introduced unleaded it does not have lead it was also introduced to reduce the emission of lead which is another toxic emission in 1999 the supreme court of india it made it mandatory it took the cognizance of the issue of increasing pollution in the country and it made it mandatory for all the vehicles of the country to meet these norms so these norms they became the india 2000 norms and all the vehicles they had to meet these norms by the year by june 2000 later in 2002 there was mashelkar committee report on the increasing pollution in india how to reduce it so this mashelkar committee report it was accepted by the government of india so it recommended a road map for employing the various vehicle standards in india on the basis of the various euro norms see euro was also using various norms for its vehicles to reduce the amount of emissions from the vehicles we would be following those norms and developing them according to india okay it also recommended that we need to roll out these norms in phases first the major cities later on the smaller cities they will have to adopt these norms so on the basis of that up until now six bharat stage norms they have been adopted at various years first was not bharat stage it was known as india 2000 this india 2000 was adopted at once throughout the country in the year 2000 then came bharat 2 in 2001 it was adopted in metros 2005 nationwide bs3 now when the nation was adopting bs2 the metro cities and the major cities they had to adopt bs3 then came bs4 then we skipped bs5 because the condition of pollution in india it was worsening and worsening we could not wait to reduce the amount of emissions from the vehicles so we skipped bs5 and directly we went to bs6 so in 2018 delhi adopted bs6 standards 2019 the national capital region and finally in 2020 there was a nationwide adoption of these centers as of now the bharat stage seven norms they haven't come out there is no declaration by when we need to adopt them however euro seven norms they have already come out and any vehicle that comes out after july 2025 in euro they will have to follow these euro seven norms now this last topic two health related bills they were introduced in lok sabha and they passed so what are these one is the national nursing and midwifery commission bill which will repeal the indian nursing council act of 1947 so it will address various issues like the standards of education creation of registers registry of the various nurses and midwives so that the people who require their assistance they can easily contact them apart from that the educational institutes they will also be scrutinized by this particular commission that will be created under this act that is the national nursing and midwifery commission there will also be research and development in order to adopt the best international practices with regards to these issues so right now according to the indian nursing council till 2022 there are 33.41 lakh nursing personnel which are registered across the country and all of them they will come under the purview of this particular act the second one is regarding the dentists now this act it will repeal the previous act the dentist act of 1948 now you can see how old these acts are they were created just after our independence so there was an extensive need to repeal them and adopt new acts for in place of them 
Now this bill, it, will, it regulates the profession of dentistry as a whole. It, in order to provide proper education, standardized education to the dentists of the country. Now it will also make accessible high quality oral health care to the various people of India. As of now, according to a report by the government, there are 2.89 lakh registered dentists in the country. So that is all about today's session. We discussed, first we discussed what are the recommendations of members of 12th Finance Commission to the upcoming 16th Finance Commission. Second, we talked about global boiling and how the various tipping points of the climate change they are being reached. Third, we talked about what? Indo-Japan relations. And last, in detailed analysis, we talked about the semiconductor sector of India and the India Semiconductor Mission. In the prelim section, in the prelim section, we first talked about the Bharat stage norms emission norms and second the two bills one regarding the nurses and midwives and the second one regarding the dentists that have just passed in the Lok Sabha. They are pending their passage in the Raj Sabha. So here are the mains practice questions. The first question is the 16th Finance Commission when set up will have some tough tasks ahead of it. Elaborate. You can elaborate how it needs to address the issue of cesses and surcharge, how it needs to address the issue of FRBM, the issue regarding the freebies and so on. Okay. The second one, the world has moved beyond global warming into the territory of global boiling, elucidate. In elucidate, that means you have to give examples that support these statements. So under the examples, you need to talk about the four things that happened. The wildfires of Greece, the heat waves in USA, increased temperature of more than 52 degree in China and extensive flash floods in North and West India. Okay. Apart from that, you can also give examples of the various tipping points how the Gulf Stream because of global warming and climate change how the Gulf Stream it is set to stop moving as early as the year 2025 so you can mention all this in this particular question so that is all about today's session I hope you were able to understand the various concepts so do not forget to head to our telegram channel after the session ends in order to take up a quiz that has been created on this session for all of you. So thank you very much and I'll see you all tomorrow.